Um, it is my honor to introduce our keynote, Doria Robinson. <laughs> Doria's keynote is titled, For the Love of Soil, Dismantling the Extractive Economy with Justice and Food Sovereignty. And as the climate crisis continues to mount, CAGJ is seeking ways to amplify how food sovereignty offers climate solutions. And we invited Doria, as she is a leader deeply engaged in climate justice organizing as a food sovereignty activist. We've gotten to know Doria as one of the leaders, as we've mentioned, of the Western region of the US Food Sovereignty Alliance. And um, this photo is from a gathering of the Western region a few years ago, and it just represents the history of Sleek Keynotes. It kind of cracked me up when I saw it, that Rosalinda Guillen, the director of Community to Community, gave the first keynote. How many of you were there for the first Slee? That's right, some of you in the room were 13 freaking years ago. And then Edgar gave the keynote last year. Now Doria, so I think Anna is next. Um, <laughs> she expertly facilitated the most complex parts of our National Assembly this past fall and is a co-convener with Edgar of the Western Region. She is a third generation resident of Richmond, California and the executive director of Urban Tilth, which she'll tell you more about. Her talents are so wide ranging. She's trained as a watershed restoration ecologist, a certified permaculture designer, a certified bay friendly gardener, and a certified nutrition educator. What? She's also a yoga instructor and the founder of Sanctuary Yoga, Richmond's first and only yoga and meditation center. In her own words, Doria is passionate about exploring her work from the perspective that physical, social, and economic health is dependent upon ecological health. The restoration of one depends on the restoration of the other. She currently lives in the neighborhood. She grew up in, in Richmond with her 17-year-old twins. Please join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to Doria. bright light effect. I can't really see anyone out there. So I just wanted to start off by saying um, thank you so much for having me. It was uh, just really great. In order to prepare for this, this talk, I actually took time and read up a little bit on um, CAGJ and I was like, whoa, I've been hanging out with Heather and Simone all this time. I didn't know all this stuff. <laughs> like, I was, I was just um, really uh, just floored by the amount of work that you know you all are doing because it's it's really a, a volunteer-driven um, project, and it made me even more um, just honored to be here. Okay, honored to be here. I think I have to hold it really close. So. I wondered what it was that I could share, you know? I, I could share the story of, of Urban Tilth, and I will a little bit. Um, and I really wanted to talk about climate, just because it, it's just so pressing. Um, but I, I felt like I needed to start with something that could anchor us, <laughs> that anchors me, and, and that's soil. And I'm actually not going to talk about it a whole lot through this whole uh, 20 minutes with you. Um, but I wanted to start with this slide because I hate this slide. <laughs> this is like the slide that you see and, it, and it's just so perfect, you know, and the hands are holding this little perfect little seedling and it's all very clean and you actually don't see anything living in the soil and that's not really the kind of soil that I'm in love with. That's not the soil that I think about when I'm like, you know, I'm so happy to be a human being on earth, you know, that I'm a part of this amazing magical experience. And, and I used it anyway because there's no pictures of the kind of soil that I feel like we need to keep in our minds and our hearts as we face huge challenges. Um, but I decided to keep it anyway because there's a, there's an, there's not an image that I can really draw on out there that really um, captures the life and the complexity of soil. But maybe moving through this presentation will help you understand um, where, where, where we need to go or where I hope we need to go. Can you change the slide? So I'm actually gonna start with groceries. 
I'm going to start with, with groceries for unreasonable prices. Um, $10.99 for a gallon of milk. $11.99 for a box of Cheerios. $10.15 for orange juice, but hey, it's on sale for $9.54. These were real prices. I just took a, a trip to Bethel, Alaska, and these are the, these are the prices <laughs> in the Bethel store for, <laughs> Bethel's in the house, um, for food. You know, for food that is actually not traditional food. And, and the painful thing is that we were invited to come up and, and kind of take a journey with Yupik people um, to hear their story and hear how they're facing and how they're dealing with food sovereignty and climate change. And, and the first thing that we really landed on was the reality of, of inequity, of forced um, economy, like an economy forced on them that has nothing to do with their traditional food ways or, or their, their sovereignty, right? Next slide. So it really made this enormous impression on me just the, con the, the, the contradiction, the, the, con the contrast um, between the stories that I was listening to from people who, who grew up in Bethel or in villages who are beyond Bethel and, and the fight that they're having for their language and their culture and their, and their lives, really. Next slide. We went up river and you know, it, it's pretty a profound experience, you know. But as we were going up, people are telling stories to us, you know, not just about the land and kind of about, about the big nature out there. Next slide. Um, but about the fish camps and how it was the last day of, of king salmon uh, season, and it was actually cut really short, and so all the fish camps were empty. Like, they were all empty. And if you can put together that in the grocery store your milk is ten ninety nine, you know, and 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 that people depend on salmon, like it really, it really, they really, really do. <laughs> and then the fish camps are empty. Um, this trip up river was just really painful, beautiful and painful. Next slide. We also visited some villages. Um, one village in particular, who were basically trying to save their village from slowly falling into the river. Like all these sandbags are actually their attempt to keep the bank from eroding out from underneath their houses. You can change the slide. They're literally trying to keep their villages out of the water. And it's like, what, what is happening, right? More glacier melt, permafrost melt, permafrost melt, 90 degrees in Anchorage last week, right? We went to a, a place at an old um, uh, school for, for, for indigenous children, you know, kind of forced school, and just kind of walked out onto the area where it would be permacross and kind of put our hands down on the earth. And they were like, you know, normally you'd be able to kind of dig down and the permacross, permafrost would be right there, but it's not. It's not there. They talked about, you know, how the, the river, which is the only way up to villages, kind of up, up river, you know, you can't, there's no roads there. You have to either fly in or take a boat. And then in the winter, it, it freezes over and people will drive on the rivers to get, to get up, up to other villages. But it's like that, that time when you can actually take a vehicle on the river is getting later and later and later every year. And it's just the impact of climate change and all of the different factors on this one particular culture was 
I, I, the only word I have for it is just really painful. You know? I think so often it's, it's abstract. It's like, you know, polar bears. Maybe it gets a little bit more concrete if you have a big storm. It, but we, we kind of go about our business thinking about food and foodways and agroecology and agriculture, and we don't think about, you know, this kind of impact, the scale of the impact, because it's not just the Yupik people, right? It's not just Alaskan indigenous people, but this kind of thing is happening all across the world. Thousands of people impacted. Next slide. <laughs> I, I saw this picture and I was like, yes, this is what, this is what. When I think of food sovereignty and when I think of what's meant by agroecology, I think like this image captures it kind of perfectly. <laughs> Just relationship, relationship to other beings, relationships to our brothers and sisters who are not human, <laughs> who are not human. And it's a profound, long, long relationship that we've had that's only really been kind of crushed in, in this last, you know, 100 years, you know, 50, 100 years. And I, I kind of wanted to, to start here so we remember what we're losing, right? When we remember what we're fighting for. We fight for the right things when it comes to just transition and not just something that's more closer to a concession. Next slide. We had the really profound pleasure of, of being a part of... Um, ceremony and dances different nights while we were in Bethel and it just reminded me too that you can't really have this conversation about climate and food without having a conversation about culture and one of the hardest things is that the cultures the peoples of the cultures that are driving the climate crisis don't recognize the role of culture in the crisis. But just chew on that for a second. Next slide. So why was I even in Alaska? You know, here I am, this urban agriculture person, grew up in Richmond, California. Why am I in Alaska with uh, you big people learning about their culture, learning about food sovereignty, learning about the impact of climate change. Um, it, it's actually because uh, a foundation who had the forethought to actually kind of bring together four communities from across the uh, United States to actually look at look at the lens, look at their 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 work in this lens of climate. Um, so it's it's. Alaska, <laughs> a number of different communities working in Alaska on food, on, on energy, on a number of different things having to do with climate change, having to do with just living a right life in the world. Um, Kentucky, you know, with this whole history of coal mining and um, kind of trying to figure out what just transition looks like for them. Buffalo, New York, and their history with steel and uh, in energy in other ways. And then Richmond, California, next slide which is where I'm from. And if you know Richmond, usually the only thing you really know about Richmond is either it's crime, <laughs> that it's the home of the Chevron refinery, the biggest point source pollution uh, of greenhouse glass emissions in the state of California, um, that it blew up <laughs> and caught on fire and September 18th in 2017, blackening the skies across the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, you might know that it's right across the bay from San Quentin. So we get a lot of folks who are coming out of San Quentin, relocated in Richmond. You might know that it's one of the poorest places in the Bay Area. It's a, minor, a majority minority city. Um, 
but you usually don't know much, like a few of these things. I always think of it as growing up on, on the front lines, right? Because I, I literally grew up five blocks from this refinery. I, this was my view out of the window of my bedroom <laughs> um, growing up. And it, it, it's, it's something to have a default where you don't really question um, things like refineries blowing up. I mean, this wasn't the first time that this happened. This is the first time it made the news like that. But I remember many, many times where there was fires. One time when a, a fire at the refinery actually ate the paint off of our cars. And I remember, you know, my mom, she, we, they would always kind of set up, you know, little centers at the different community centers. You'd go down, you would apply for for money to be able to, you know, get some little references. But they give you like, you know, I think we got $500 to repaint our car. And it took like, you know, almost eight months to get that $500. And I remember my mom finally got the check and she was like, well, what are they gonna do about our lungs? But the culture in Richmond, you know, is that we don't question it. It's just the way it is. Not only is it just the way it is, but Chevron does things like gives backpacks to kids, you know, <laughs> Woo! you know, hands out a few small, you know, kind of scholarships, you know. And so people feel like, you know, they're doing good in the community, uh, right? But they don't really question this relationship. You know that this billion dollar company is sitting in the backyard of one of the poorest places in, this, in, the, in, in the state and there is no change and no questioning that there's no responsibility for what they spew in the air on our lungs. You have some of the highest asthma rates, some of the highest cancer rates. There's no relationship. You know, there's one grocery store for 100,000 people. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no thinking that the, the culture is that we are less than them and that we have to accept or work harder because obviously whatever is going wrong in the world has to do with us. Next slide. I feel like climate change <laughs> is this thing that that actually brought together a number of different things that have been happening for a long time. Not only do I feel like this, but that is what it is. <laughs> Climate change didn't happen today or tomorrow. In fact, most people know this, that we're experiencing the effects of climate change from things that were done, you know, 50 years ago, right? Like we're not, we haven't actually begun to experience the effects of the emissions that we're doing today or last year or 10 years, that will be 50 years in the future, right? There's this lag effect. So our actions have this delayed impact. So often when we think about climate change, we think about it in the realm of energy. Like gas, Alaska, you know, they are, you know, extracting gas from the earth. They're getting oil, oil, making gas in Richmond, refining, refining it in Richmond and sending it all around. It's all about energy. It's all about fuel. We have to change our energy. We need electric cars. We need, you know, <laughs> we need, you know, this. And I, I'm not saying we don't need electric cars, but I'm actually saying, or, or bicycles, but I'm actually saying the problem is deeper and it started happening, this started happening well before oil. I'm saying that this actually had its roots in things like the steam engine, not because steam is bad, but because of the way it's being applied to the world, how, how it is an expression of our culture, of this culture. I'm saying that it started in colonialism in, in, in the extraction of slave labor, the stealing of people, right? The stealing of people and bringing them over to do work. 
Like there is something else going on that is the driver in this, this phenomena that's causing so much current pain. These massive storms, the desertification, the, the fires in California and, and all across the West, right? But it, it, it only recently, like, it's not just energy. It's actually, in my opinion, our culture. Next slide. So there's this big question ab about transition and whether or not it will be just. And I say we, we're kind of jumping ahead. Like, we don't even understand or really embrace the true root causes of the things that we're facing, and we don't even understand the great complexity of the things that we're facing. But people, even, 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 like, not even all people, right? Some people are, like, you know, embracing this idea that, you know, we have to have a transition or else we're all going to die because we, we can't sustain this path. <laughs> Human beings can't sustain this path on earth, right? Um, and, and then some people are saying, and that transition must be just. And I'm saying we actually can't even get to the just transition until we understand what justice is and where injustice comes from. Okay, next slide. And I, I want to pose to you to just bring this home and, and noodle it around and think about it, um, about this concept of extraction. That our economy, the way we care for home, the way we manage home, which is what economy means, the ecos, is using this lens of extraction. It's a tool of capitalism, the way that we practice capitalism. And the root problem is that there's a philosophy behind it that you can just continually extract with no consequence. And actually that's the point, right? Like you're actually practicing it correctly if you're increasing constantly ever increasing your profits, no matter what the consequence, because the consequence, as long as it doesn't show up on your books, is fine. Right? Chevron is fine to spew and spew and spew as long as they don't have to be held accountable for it. As long as it doesn't show up on their books. Right? We're all fine to live our lives however we feel like it. Drive to the corner store. Do whatever it is that makes us feel comfortable. How we've been accultured, how we've been culture to live our lives as long as we don't have to be the ones in Bethel dealing with the impacts of our actions. So I, I wanted to spend this time, this little bit of time that I have with everybody, to bring up this thought. This thought that extraction is a huge part of our culture. Next slide. That extraction shows up in a whole bunch of different ways, right? It's not just energy. It's the way that we actually run our agriculture, our big ag. It's all about trying to extract as, as much crop, as much yield as possible, no matter what we do to, to get there. You know, GMOs, the pesticides, no matter what it is. We'll apply that so we can get the most yield for our shareholders. Or, and, or, you know, that's, that's the point. We're doing it right. It's actually working. That is the point. Next slide. It shows up over and over again. We'll get the most we can out of these beings, right? They're not going to be beings anymore. They're going to be commodities, and we're going to drive them as hard as we can. We're going to grow them as big as they will grow. We're going we're gonna, to, you know, breathe them so they can't stand up, you know, because we want those breasts big because that gets us more. Like, this is, this is our culture. They're doing it right. Next slide. 
And it's harder to see with things like the control of seeds, but it's still the same thing, the same drive, the same extracting of communal knowledge, of communal uh, relationship to living things, privatizing it, and then maximizing the profit. Next slide. So I, I wanted to bring this up because I wanted to make sure that I was going to spend time coming up here, getting on a plane, and, you know, and everything that I, I wanted to share something I felt was really real and really important and really hard because it's hard to change culture. It's hard to change the ways we live our lives, the way we've been taught to live our lives. But I feel like that actually is the just transition. Yes, it will show up in the Green New Deal and specific things that make sure to be inclusive of communities that have been historically left out of the economy, who have you know, grassroots solutions and whatnot. Yes, that is a part of it too, but if we don't actually, every single one of us, not just people in frontline communities, address and, and confront this issue of our culture. <laughs> just transition is just gonna be, you know, a concession. Most of the transition will just be the way that every single thing else runs. Some corporation somewhere will put solar panels everywhere. And, 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 and there'll be some part of it that is still driven by extraction. Where were those panels made? Who gets that money? Who decided? Who was involved in those decisions? Probably not democratic. Probably having some externalities somewhere. You know, maybe not here, not in front of our faces, but it's there. So I wanted to bring this up and just make sure that as we're thinking about culture, agriculture, you know, food sovereignty, that we're really thinking holistically. Next slide. So, this notion that food sovereignty through agroecology is the solution to the fo broken food system, I say is, is kind of like a metaphor for, for almost everything that we, we need to do. Food sovereignty is, is basically democratically kind of including everyone in the decision making, the ownership, the, the relationship to place, the relationship not just to the food that you grow, not just to the crops, but to the whole systems that are related to it. And it's not just relationship, but I wanted to say that it's a interdependent relationship, a vulnerable, interdependent relationship with all of these things. Next slide. It's also complex. So here goes soil again. Like what really is soil? It's a whole host of living beings with air, gases from the beginning of the universe, you know, crushed rock from the beginning of the universe. It's all of these different relationships, you know, different, different, you know, some people eating other people, some people doing this, some people doing that. They're all kind of living together, creating this economy amongst them, each other. And it's like, this is the kind of thing that we don't, most people don't have a relationship to. Like, if you looked at this as a metaphor for the types of relationships you want to have in your life, maybe not exactly with soil, but with something, how many of us can say that we have this kind of detailed knowledge, interdependent relationship with something in our lives? With something that makes us accountable? besides our nuclear families, right? Those are the only kind of acceptable things that we can have that kind of relationship with. And sometimes not even that. So I wanted to end just by saying that, you know, we can't do everything. We try to do what we can. Um, I love uh, this notion that Wangari um, brought up around the hummingbird, you know? Like, they have this, this, have people heard that 
story before about hummingbird? Yes, no? No. So there's an African um, a, a kind of a story about hummingbird and a, and a fire, a forest fire, a big fire. So it's a big fire happening and, and you know, all the animals are watching the fire. They're literally sitting, standing there like in mouths gaping, watching the fire. And, and you know, there's elephant there and there's, there's the lion there and they're like, oh my God, everything is burning. What can we do? It's too big for us. It's too big. And then hummingbird is like, you know, it's a little tiny bird. Everybody knows hummingbirds are really tiny. And, and he is like, you know, I'm going to do something. So he flies over to the river and he gets a drop of water and he flies to the fire and he drops the water on the fire. And he goes back and he keeps doing it and all the animals are like, what are you doing? You're too small. You can't make an impact. You know, as elephant who has this big trunk, you know, is standing there like, what are you doing? You can't make an impact. And all these other bigger animals who could do other things are just standing there and watching it burn. And the hummingbird was saying, it said, you know, well, this is what I can do. And so I'm going to do it. This is what I can do. And so I'm going to do it. And I felt like, and, and Wangari says this in this video that I watched in the movie Dirt, um, that we all need to be like hummingbird. And if more of us were like hummingbird, then maybe some of this stuff would get worked out. We need to do what we can do. <laughs> so this is what I do. <laughs> I grow food in the face of the biggest oil refinery um, in the state of California, the biggest point source emitter of, of greenhouse gases. We transform public land into places where healthy food grows. Um, next slide. Um, we dream up things like farms in the middle of cities, and, and we make it happen slowly, carefully, you know, with community, with dem democratic process. Next slide. We start farm stands and CSAs run by people from the community who have actually been trained to grow food, to run farm stands, to run CSAs. You know? Next slide. <laughs> we, we do what we can, actually, to change our situation, to have that kind of self-determination, as much sovereignty as we can muster within the belly of this beast, right? Just inspiring the fire of young people, where you just really don't know how those seeds are gonna, gonna work, what, what they're gonna produce, right? Next slide. We also have been taking really, you know, scary steps, but awesome steps to create relationships in our rural environments with young farmers and actually connecting them with our CSA and with our farm stands to actually create a local food system that shortens supply chains, reduces food miles, and actually employs people all along the way. Next. So what I, what I wanted to try to offer today was, was not so much this big notion of, you know, what agroecology is or what climate change is or, or you know, just transition. What I wanted to do is say, what is your roadmap, hummingbird? <laughs> what is your roadmap, hummingbird? I wanted to ask you to embrace the complexity, to get in relationship with the beings around you. If you don't know your neighbors, get to know your neighbors. I feel like the one thing that we always kind of forget in our fights and in our battles, and I'm kind of gonna end with this, is why we live at all. Like what is this life about? You know, when we come to the end of our lives, are we going to remember our electric car? You know, are we, are we going to remember, you know, the school that we went to or the great job that we got? What is it that's going to be the thing that we remember? 
And I imagine it's probably going to be the relationships. Whatever, whatever energy you put into those relationships is probably where you'll end, where you'll end up, where you'll, where you'll transition. So I say right now, let's make this roadmap and let's remember that culture is at the core and relationship is, is the vehicle. So thank you. Thank you so much, Doria. That was incredible.